Well, welcome to Creekside this morning. It's good to see all of you who are here. I encourage you to come find a seat as we worship the Lord together. Um, the psalmist said, as for me, I will always have hope. I will praise you more and more. And that is what we want to do today. So if you'd stand and join us, if you're able, uh, join us in, in singing songs of praise. Bethlehem, Ephrath, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be a ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth, and he will be our peace. shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. On his robe and on his thigh he is a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords.
Amen. And uh, just want to welcome you here the Creekside Church. If you're worshiping with us here in person or you're online, we're just grateful that you're worshiping with us this morning. Glad to have you with us. I have a couple of announcements. First of all, if you're here as a guest for the first time in the bulletin, there is an extra flap. If you would uh, fill that out and then put it in the offering box on the welcome table as you leave this, uh, this morning, that would be great. Sure appreciate it. Just have a record of your attendance if you do that for us. Uh, young people, you are dismissed for Sunday school. Okay, so I am making that late announcement. All right. Also, I just want to say that today is the collection day for the little free food pantry. That's a little blue box that you see standing out in our parking lot or near our parking lot. So if you forgot, that's okay. Uh, if you want to bring it back yet this afternoon, we won't be collecting it and sending it over there until probably tomorrow or Tuesday. So that'd be good. The, uh, uh, there's a sign-up sheet for a super Christmas gathering with soup with the... the the Shens, 65 and older, okay, they're having a party on December 11th at noonish, so you can uh, join them for that if you want, even if you're not at that age group, they'll, they'll let you come if you bring something, okay, they're, they're, they're pretty agreeable, uh, they're a pretty agreeable group, so that's on that, the 19th, December 19th is our children Christmas program, that'll be during the morning worship service, so we'll have the program and a, and a shorter message and good thing, it's the second Sunday of Advent. So it kind of sneaks up on you, you know, like last Sunday was the first Sunday of Advent, but it was still in November. But then now we're the second Sunday of Advent in which we're anticipating the, the, the celebration of the birth of Jesus. Not that he hasn't been born, but we're going to remember the, that he was born. And uh, not uh, totally ironically, but this morning as we look at the word, we're going to be focusing on not his first Advent, but his second Advent. Uh, one more thing I want to call to your attention. There is a a survey in the bulletin, okay, so this is just, uh, I know some of you are not going to listen to this, but uh, if you'd not fill that out during the service, that'd be great, uh, but we do want you to fill it out before you leave. I told the first service folks, if you're like me, I get all these surveys from doing business or whatever on my email, and I just delete them. Uh, we'd rather you didn't do that. Uh, we really, the elders are really trying to encourage you to do this, and in the bulletin, there's an announcement as to why. We're trying, first of all, to, uh, get a, to validate what, what all's happening. How, how are people involved in, at Creekside? How are we involved in the church? How are we involved in the community as far as ministry? And then we're also not just trying to find out what's happening and how people are involved, but we also want to, uh, to motivate us to use our gifts and abilities. I don't know about you, but I'm standing here and I'm just going, I, I was totally blessed. I've been totally blessed this morning. As you sit up here and you listen to beautiful voices and uh, Chris and uh, the musicians, it's like, what a blessing in this church. And they're just a small portion of how God is, is using it. And, you know, and, and Dakota and Alan and Amy, they're putting together these services. And our sound people are back there making all this stuff happen behind the scenes. We don't even know it. And so I just am encouraged and want to see us using our gifts and abilities as God calls us to because and I was having a conversation with uh, one of our missionaries yesterday and it seems to me like people a lot of times the church is what what is in it for me you know and it's like God calls us into the family of God to be of use for him now yeah it's nice to be benefit we're supposed to love one another and care for one another encourage one another pray for one another uh and serve one another, and stimulate one another to love and good deeds. And so that's part of this survey, is to kind of help motivate us. I know I'm reading through the survey, and I'm going, oh yeah, there's some areas here that I, I need to uh, let the Lord work in my heart on. And then finally, uh, we just want to elevate our, our love for each other, and love for our community. So that's the, that's the call. I appreciate you do that. If you fill it out before you leave today, that'd be great. Uh, but Maybe not during the, the message, that'd be okay too, uh, but whatever, if, if you have to fill that out during the message, and, and uh, then you can listen online, I'm sure you'll do that later, um, not, but uh, the, if you would do that, or if you can just go online now, I, I'm sorry, Mike, is it on the church website? How do they get that online? Okay, creeksidedm.com slash survey, okay, you can go there, and uh, I was 
not able to find it, so that's helpful for me. Okay, let's pray. Father, uh, what, a, what a wonderful name is the name of Jesus. And a strong tower. And the righteous run in uh, to you and, and are saved. And Lord, I pray uh, that as we look at your word and discuss and consider the truths about the second coming of Jesus, that you would open our eyes, that we would behold wonderful truths from your law. I pray that you would help us to see with discerning eyes and discerning hearts and with a sense of humility in knowing that we really don't totally understand everything, but we can apply and we can cling to what we do know. And so I pray uh, for you to help us see your word for what it really is, the word of God and not the word of men, that it would touch our lives and change our hearts and change who we are in our daily existence. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Former NBA star Charles Barkley was notorious for making this comment when somebody had made a terrible play. He would go, that's terrible, terrible, terrible. It was not good. And I thought about that in light of the fact that as we continue on with the Jesus' elaboration on the answer to his question, the questions of the disciples, in Matthew chapter 24, verse 3, they ask him this question, these questions. Tell us, when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And as Jesus elaborates on that in, in the passage we're looking at this morning in Matthew 24, verses 15 through 28, his tone, I think turns increasingly somber as he looks at the future which promises to be terrible, terrible, terrible. It's not good as he looks down the telescope into the future of what he sees. And so in Matthew chapter 24, which is where we're at, this Sermon on the Mount, no, all of the discourse, which is on the, the same place as the Sermon on the Mount, but the Olivet Discourse. As, as, he, as he's here in the Olivet Discourse, as we look at this, we're going to see two more pieces of the, the puzzle, the end of the age puzzle, okay? That serves, I think, first of all, to inform uh, the disciples, us, those who are named the name of Jesus, to inform us about what is about to happen and the horrors that precede the second coming of Christ. It's to instruct believers so that uh, if you're alive at this time, then you're going to be able to endure what's going on. It's to inspire Christians to share the gospel so that other people will not endure the horrors of the judgment and the, of this time that they might, not, they might escape it. And then finally, it's to invite those who don't know Christ as personal Lord and Savior that they might come to the saving knowledge of Christ and be delivered from God's judgment. So I'm here in Matthew chapter 24, beginning with verse 15. If you have your Bibles or you have a device or if you want to reach under the seat in front of you, there should be a, a Bible there. I'm going to read verses 15 through 28, and then we'll look at these two pieces of the, two more pieces of the end of the age puzzle. Verse 15. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, and then in parentheses, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to get things out that are in the house, in his house. And let him who is in the field not turn back to get his cloak. But woe to those who are with child and to those who nurse babes in those days. But pray that your flight may not be in winter or on a Sabbath, for then there will be a great tribulation such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world, nor now, until now, nor shall ever be. And unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved, but for the sake of the elect, those days shall be cut short. Then if anyone says to you, behold, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe him. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Behold, I have told you in advance. If therefore they say to you, Behold, he is in the wilderness, do not go forth. 
Or behold, he is in the inner rooms. Do not believe them. For just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. Two more pieces to fit into the end times puzzle. And the first one is this, we learn of the reality of the abomination of desolations. He begins in verse 20, or four, chapter 24, verse 15. Therefore, when you see, it introduces yet another sign of the end of the age. It was just the other day, I, I heard and then I saw some geese flying. And when we hear and see the geese flying south, we know that winter is coming. When we see and hear the geese flying north, we know that spring is coming. And so we see this yet another sign, and the sign is given to us, stated, the abomination of the desolations spoken of by the prophet Daniel. Now, there are a lot of interpretations with regard to understanding this, okay? And I'm offering to you uh, I'm trying to offer as humbly as I can my understanding, best understanding at this time in my, my study, okay? And what I'm about to share is a little bit of a kind of a rewind to when Doug was talking and sharing in Matthew chapter 21 where Jesus was coming into Jerusalem because it's the same passage that's being referred to in Daniel chapter 9. And so if you'll just hold on to me, on with me, I guess not on to me, but hold on with me, uh, we're going gonna, to gonna fly through some stuff. And again, I share this with you as my best understanding. There are a lot of other guys, and I'm sure most of them are smarter than me, that, that maybe understand it differently. But I hope to explain why and how I understand it the way I do. Here we go. Matthew In Daniel chapter 9, you don't have to turn there. I'm going to give you some slides of Daniel. You can if you want. Turn to Daniel chapter 9. But in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, uh, the text says the angel Gabriel had come to Daniel and he's telling Daniel that during this captivity, this captivity that they're in is going is to end and he says that there's a 70 week period. Okay. Now, again, the 70 week period is, is a, each week represents a group of seven years. Okay. So there's 70 weeks and each week represents a group of seven years. So 70 times seven is a 490 years so that's what he's talking about there's a 490 year period of time that would pass before according to Daniel chapter 9 verse 24 I understand it that God would establish his righteous kingdom okay so there's going to be this 490 years would pass before this establishment of this kingdom now uh, the coming uh counting I'm sorry the counting of when does that 490 years begin the counting starts according to Daniel, when the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem is, is said, which most people would agree began in 445 B.C. So from 445 B.C., 490 years after that, then we're going to see the Messiah is going to come. All right, that's what, that's what he's, he's saying. Well, from the, from the decree, the first from the time of the decree, there will be seven weeks, 49 years, okay, plus another 62 weeks, 69 weeks total, 483 years until the Messiah comes. So there's, I'm sorry, I have to back up. There's 490 years, seven years, seven weeks, that's 49, plus 62, 483. So there's 483 years from the time when this decree to rebuild the temple in 445 B.C. until the coming of Messiah. Okay, so 69 weeks. There's 70 weeks total, but there's only 69 weeks. That's 483 years. And Doug masterfully walked us through it. So it was 483 lunar uh, years based on the lunar calendar that the Hebrews gave. You go from 445 B.C., 483 years, and you get to 32 A.D., which is precisely when Jesus came, coming, came into Jerusalem riding on the donkey. Okay, so that's all in the, the, the text of Scripture. So now, according to Daniel, that's according to Daniel 9.25. So you are to know and understand that from the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild the Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. 
483 years. It's exactly what happened, fulfilled historically in Jesus coming into Jerusalem on 32 and 32 AD. All right? So, that there's certain important events that are going to happen after the 69 weeks, but before the 70th week. So, if we look at Daniel chapter 9, verse 26, then we see then after the 62 weeks. Now, most scholars would understand that after the 62 weeks, there's a seven-week period before that. So it's a total of 69 weeks. So after the 69 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off. So what's an important event that will happen after the 69 weeks? Messiah will be cut off. When did that happen? At the crucifixion. And then, and the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city. The destruction of Jerusalem. Which I believe is a reference to what happened in AD, chapter, AD 70. Okay? And the prince who is to come, these will be the people of the, uh, the people of the prince who is to come, which is a reference to the Antichrist. Okay? So, uh, they'll, they'll, the Antichrist, he's going to pretend, this Antichrist, he's going to pretend that he's Israel's ally. And he's a friend of Israel. But uh, he'll make an alliance with the nations that will generally correspond at, at that time to the, to the Roman Empire. Boom. Now, He'll convince the confederacy, this group of people, this group of nations that he's aligned with, to make a firm covenant. And this is in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, okay? And with the Jewish people at the beginning of the 70th week, okay? And he will confirm a covenant with many for one week. That's the last week. So there's 69 weeks, and then there's one more week, and this is the one week. During that final week, the Antichrist will make this covenant, the people of the prince, and he will make this covenant with the, the nations, and then he'll break the covenant. And he will put a, he'll put a stop to the sacrifice and the grain offering, and on the wing of abominations, there it is. That's what Jesus is referring to in Matthew 24, and he's referring to this wing of abominations, okay? In the middle of that week, he'll put an end to the sacrifice of the grain offerings and desecrate the temple. According to Matthew 24, he'll be standing in that place. 24, 15. So you've been in Daniel, now look back at Matthew 24. Matthew, Daniel, Matthew 24, verse 15. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolations, which was spoken of through Daniel, the prophet, standing in the holy place. That's it. Standing in the holy place, demanding to be worshipped. Which I understand to be a fulfillment of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, um, uh, verses 3 and 4. No one is to deceive you in any way. For it will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God and object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God displaying himself as being God. So I understand that Daniel chapter 9 verse 27 which Jesus is referring to in Matthew chapter 24 is ultimately fulfilled in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. This man of lawlessness is the prince who is to come, uh, the people of the prince who is to come, okay? And he's standing in the holy place demanding to be worshipped. So if you aren't confused yet, uh, we're going to continue, but even if you are, we're going to continue, okay? So it, the idea, and I understand it, his abominable action will trigger the most, you know, a, a, a tremendous holocaust, for the Jews and treachery that the world has never known. If you look at verse 21 of Matthew 24. For then there will be a great tribulation such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world. Nor until now nor ever will be. So what does all this mean? I'm going to share with you what I think it means. And then you can, you can go from there. But what I would say is that uh, the, the presence of the conspicuous sign of horrors to come shouldn't be ignored. He says at the end of verse 15, let the reader understand. How many of you know, would know what to do if uh, you were at the ocean and all of a sudden the water from the ocean, the beach, just started drastically receding out to sea? What does that mean? There's a tidal wave coming. So if you're ever at the ocean and all of a sudden the waters just start going... Now, I'm not talking about low tide. I'm talking about the water just immediately receding back into the ocean. There's a tidal wave coming. You better get to high ground as quickly as possible. Well, let the reader understand what is being talking, talked about here. Throughout uh, 
throughout history, there have been a number of desecrations of the temple. Okay? There's been a number of events that have been claimed to be the fulfillment of this abomination of desolations where the temple was desecrated and Jerusalem had been, had been ransacked and destroyed. And the, the first one was back in... Uh, 175 to 165 BC with a guy by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes and uh, he initially uh, it's referred initially he's committed sacrilege and he he when he claimed to be God he brutally sacrificed he, he, he sacrificed a pig on the altar it, back in Jerusalem it was is a horrible time in the history of, of the Jewish people but there's been other ones okay desecrations of the temple particularly uh, in 66 to 70 AD and so what I'm suggesting is I understand the historic desecration as part of a sequence of preparatory fulfillments which lead up to the fulfillment ultimately at the end of the age so the one that took place back in 175 to 165 BC under Antiochus Epiphanes well was it a fulfillment it was an initial and a partial fulfillment of what was is prophesied by Daniel, but it wasn't the fulfillment. When it, what took place shortly after Jesus spoke these words, and to which I believe he was referring in Matthew chapter 23, verse 38. Look at Matthew 23, 38. He says, Behold, your house is being left desolate. Then look at chapter 24, four, verse 2. And he answered and said to them, Do you not see all these things? Truly I say to you, not one stone here shall be left upon another which will not be torn down. That, that, was a, that was a precursor because shortly after Jesus spoke these words, and I think he's referring in these words initially, immediately, to what was going to take place in Jerusalem. Historically, Jerusalem was ransacked by the Romans in 66 to 70 AD, and they, they turned it upside down, and I think it was a, another partial fulfillment of what Jesus is referring to and what Daniel was referring to here, so that Josephus would say church historian, after 70 AD, he said that future visitors to the spot had no ground for believing that it had ever been inhabited. So people, after 70 AD, they came to Jerusalem and they, they was so devastated and no stone was left that they thought, nobody ever lived here. Okay, nobody ever lived here. God's judgment on Jerusalem and the temple throughout her history, I think, teaches the, the people of God, not to trust in a magnificent sanctuary, but to look and put our trust in a merciful Savior. It's not a sanctuary that you trust. It's a, it's a Savior that you trust. Previous devastation, I believe, points to the ultimate abomination of desolations, which I don't think has happened yet. Okay? So I think Antiochus Epiphanes, you don't have to know this. I don't know if you're like me. I, I took church history seminary. It's like, oh, I get sick. And I don't, I, there's, there, he's Antiochus Epiphanes number four because there were three before him and there's probably some after him. It's like, I can't keep one, three, four, five. I can't keep all the Philips. I can't keep all the kings of England. I can't keep who, you know, who's who. You don't have to worry about that. But there was a guy, okay? <laughs> and he was a nasty guy back in 175 to 165 B.C. And he desecrated the temple and destroyed Jerusalem. Then there was another guy. He was uh, called uh, uh, one of the Caesars. And he took over. And uh, back in AD, 60, or AD 66 and AD 70, he sent his Roman armies into the Jerusalem and they devastated. All of these are partial, I believe, fulfillments of what is pointing, Daniel is pointing to, to the ultimate fulfillment in the abomination of desolation, which is Daniel is talking to. So they're immediately, and so here Jesus is speaking hyperbolically uh, of what would take place immediately. He's, he's describing what's about to take place. Remember, Jesus is alive at 32 A.D., What's going to happen in 66, 70 AD is after that. So he's predicting what's going to happen in hyperbolic language. Okay. And Daniel tells us that the one will stand and stop the sacrifices and the temple will be destroyed and it's about to happen. Okay. But Jesus is also, I believe, sharing what's going to ultimately happen because the language, its descriptions are even beyond what took place in AD 66 and AD 70. It's more 
hyperbolic. The Antichrist, the prince who is to come, he is not yet done completely what this predicted would happen. Okay? Daniel spoke of a holocaust of unprecedented severity leading to repentance and the salvation of his people. Look at the language in verse 21. For then there will be a great tribulation such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever shall be. I don't see that you can put all of that into A.D. 66 and A.D. 70. So there is this abomination of desolations. That's the piece of the puzzle. The second piece of the puzzle comes to us. We learn the results of the abomination of desolations. Okay, In verses 16 through 28. There's two end-of-the-age events that are triggered by this abomination of desolations that are revealed to us in verses 16 through 28. The first is the Great Tribulation. The Great Tribulation that I believe is previewed okay, by what happened in A.D. 70. There actually literally was a destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in A.D. 66 through 70. I believe it previews, it's a preview of what Jesus is speaking to ultimately would happen uh, here in the Great Tribulation. Fully realized in the age to come. And Jesus uses three tactics to describe how horrific it would be that I believe confirm that it's not something that's already happened in its totality. First of all, the command to flee. If you look at verses 16 through 18... It says this, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, let those who are on the housetops not go down to get the things out of their house, and let him who is in the field not turn back to get his cloak. Uh, Luke 21, uh, 20 uh, describes it in in this way, because these are the days of punishment, so that things which have been written will be fulfilled. So, back in AD 68, when the Roman armies came into Jerusalem, People did flee into the mountains, okay? They didn't stop uh, and go down and get stuff, and they uh, didn't hang around in the fields. But I believe what's here, like what happened then, what's described here is the fury of the Antichrist that will target the Jewish people and all who come to believe in Jesus during those days. And the threat to life will be so great that you better not hang around. It's not something you want to hang around. You just get out of there. You're not going down to get a cloak. You're not going to get a coat. You're running for your very life. Don't pack. Don't grab something. Leave. That's what he's telling to the people who will be alive at that time. I remember uh, uh, talking to Dick Dirks. Dick Dirks was a World War II survivor. And uh, Dick had been a, he was a, he was a German soldier who had been captured by the Americans. Treated so well by the Americans that after the war he wanted to move to America. So he moved to America and became a citizen, learned the language, became a citizen of the United States. And uh, he was alive during the tornado in Belmont, Iowa in 1966. There was a horrific tornado in Belmont in 1966 that took some lives and created a lot of devastation. And he told me a story that he was walking during the hurricane. His wife, whose name was Tilly, uh, she was screaming at him, Dick, get to the basement, get to the basement. Well, Dick, he was kind of a stubborn old German, and so he was walking upstairs. He was going to look out the window and see what was going on outside. And so as he was walking up the stairs, a two-by-four went right through the wall in front of him. And when the two-by-four went through the wall, because it was driven by the, the force of the tornado, he immediately went to the basement. Okay. Uh, he, was, he, was, he was fleeing to the basement. And that's the idea here, is, is to flee. Luke 21, uh, 22 uh, tells us that it, we, these are the days of vengeance. These are days of vengeance from which many will not escape. Okay, And they'll suffer the wrath of God. And God will purge his rebellious people, the Jewish people who have been rejecting him. And he'll offer, uh, but he'll save a remnant. He'll save a remnant. And he tells us that in Zechariah chapter 13, verses 8 and 9, that there will be a remnant, and it will come about in all the land, declares the Lord, that two parts in it will be cut off and perish, but the third will be left in it, and that's all the further we need to go. So if two-thirds are cut off, one-third, he's leaving a remnant. Why? Because God is 
seeking to restore a people to himself, not just the Jewish people, but from all nations. And we've seen this as we've gone through the Gospel of, of Matthew. And the believers, uh, some believers at the time, believers at the time will be martyred and killed. And the Revelation chapter 6 uh, talks about this, verses 9 through 11. And if I'm wrong, okay, my understanding of this is, this is a horrible thing that's going to happen from which the church will not be present. Okay? This last week, uh, Daniel's 70th week. But if I'm wrong, uh, and we are present, at least we know what's coming, okay? So we, we'd be prepared for it. We, we are aware of what's happening. In the first century Jews, they took heed to what Jesus had said. Those alive at the time that uh, Jerusalem was sacked and the temple was destroyed, they, they obeyed. They left everything. They gave up their livelihoods, they gave up their homes, and they left their place of worship, the temple. And they went into the hills, and they survived. The historians tell us that. Eusebius tells us that that's what they did. A little side note, application here. Um, do we believe God's word in the same way they, they did? Are we willing to act and be obedient to God's word in the same way that the first century Jews did when they saw the Roman armies coming in? Are we as committed to trust God and obey his word in our own lives when it comes to loving other people? Forgiving other people? When it comes to being patient and kind and generous? Are we as committed to trust God and love him when it regards to accepting what his word says about human sexuality? God's word says about how we should use our money. God's word says... And gives us instructions on our work. I don't know. Or are we committed mostly to look at life in a selfish way? We view our work. We view financial security. Do we view safety and convenience and comfort as the thing which will provide us the greatest satisfaction and the greatest security in life even above God. It's idolatry. We look into something else to provide us with the satisfaction that only God can provide. Remember when, I think it was Matt uh, Deaver who was quoting somebody who said that we look at idols and idols and we look at them as pictures that we admire rather than as a window through which we see the glory of God and the goodness of God. Well, sometimes I'm convinced that we look at our safety and our convenience and what's comfortable and we cling to it. Financial security. We look at our children, we look at all these things as something that we're going to find satisfaction that only God can provide. But we're looking to these other things. You see, obedience is evidence of our faith in God and the reality of our faith. It's also the way that God shows his love towards us. He who has my commandments and keeps them, he it is that loves me. And he that loves me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and disclose myself to him. As we were obedient to God, we demonstrate our love to Him, and He reveals more of Himself to us. And if we say that we have come to know Him and we do not keep His commandments, John tells us we're a liar, and the truth is not in us. By this we know we have come to know Him if we keep His commandments, 1 John 2, 3. So there's a call for obedience. And so we see, first of all, the horrors depicted for us through the command to flee. Secondly, we see it through His concern for the people in verse 20. Verse 19, he says, but woe. Oh, we've seen that word again. Remember chapter 23? Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Seven times, woe. It's impending doom. So doom is coming. And that's what Jesus is saying. And the flight will be most treacherous for, for those who are pregnant or with little children. Why? Because they have a hard time getting away. It's difficult for them. And then verse 20. But pray that your flight may not be in the winter or in Sabbath. That God would prevent a winter flight, which, I mean, well, we live in Iowa, right? The weather prevents our flight, whether you're flying south or flying north. Uh, we have to pay attention to the weather, right? So same thing for, uh, you know, the, the, the end of the age when there's a, a fleeing from this destruction Prior to the Lord's return, same thing happened in Jerusalem. Don't, we don't want this to be in winter because it's harder to get around. It's, 
impedes our travel. And then, don't, not in the Sabbath. Well, why not on Sabbath? Well, Sabbath is because we're worshiping on Sabbath, because we're worshiping the Lord, because it's harder to get transportation if you're a, a Jewish person because people aren't, you know, operating businesses on the Sabbath day. And then you're also violating the Sabbath <laughs> if you travel too far, if you're a, a good Orthodox Jewish person. But interestingly enough, and one commentator brought this out, and I thought it was, it was rather appropriate challenge to me. Look at, pray to whom? The sovereign God who's bringing this abomination, that he would grant grace for some little things and maybe some big things. And there's a lesson here, I think, for us. That we can pray to a sovereign God. That our prayers to a sovereign God are not futile. That our prayers to a sovereign God are not fruitless. That our prayers are to a God who actually knows and who cares and who's impacted by our prayers. So that whether our prayers are little prayers, oh God, you know, like here, don't, don't send this thing that we have to flee during winter or on Sabbath, but maybe you're praying for something a little simpler, like just safety as you travel. Or maybe you're praying that God would open up a parking spot closer to the door at the mall. Or, you know? And you say, well, that's a stupid prayer. Well, does God care about you? Now, maybe if it's a totally vain, selfish prayer, God's going to say, eh, not so much. But it's not that we couldn't pray to God. You would ask your parents for simple stuff like that when you were a child. Can I have another cookie? And your mom looks at you, no. Oh, she say, no, you have to wait till supper. Or, sure. We serve a loving God. And so we can pray. We can pray for the big stuff too, not just the immediate stuff, but for the big stuff. We can pray, God, would you heal me of this cancer? God, would you bring my wayward child who's walking away from, from you, would you bring them back to yourself? Because he's a God who's a sovereign God, but he's also a loving and intimate and personal God. And he cares about these things. And so we can pray for him. Pray to him. He's a sovereign God and he cares. And then finally we see the, the, the characterization of the trouble that I believe seems to indicate this is something that has not yet happened yet in verses 21 and 22. For then there will be a great tribulation such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever shall be. And unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved, but for the sake of the elect, those days have been, will have been cut short. Four introduces the reason for the urgency. See that? The word four, in circle, in Bible, that's a reason for the urgency. When I was a senior in high school, I was working for Bob Martin, a farmer south of New Iowa, and uh, it was harvest time, and we had, uh, it was, it was, the, the stalks were dry in the fields, but there was, it, it had rained previous to that, so it was kind of, the ground was a little bit soft. I was driving a, a, what we call a straight truck, okay, it's not a semi, but it's a big truck that has a big box on it, you know, so you can load grain in it. I was driving this straight truck, it's an old straight truck. You know, it was a manual transmission, so there's no automatic transmission. Manual transmission, you had to use a clutch. And uh, it was so old, this truck was so old and rusted and dilapidated that I could see the ground beneath me because the floorboard had been rusted out. You know, I could see the, you know, the, the ground beneath me. So the, the combine came by, loaded me up. I had a full load of grain, you know, four or 500 bushel, you know, you figured out, 56 pounds to the bushel in corn and uh, so I'm loaded down you know and so I'm starting trying to start up and I I put put it in gear and I let out the clutch and push down on the gas and boom you know it was like soggy and it just couldn't go so I started up again and tried again and, boom. and I looked down and the corn stalks underneath the truck are on fire they're burning and my first thought was I'm dead my second thought was, run. My third thought was, start the engine, floor it, and pop the clutch, and get out of here. I took option three. <clears throat> and I'm here. So, by God's grace, I got out of there, uh, and uh, the, the corn got to, to market, or got to the elevator, or wherever it was supposed to go, and I was saved. But the idea was that it was so, the four 
What was the urgency? Why is the urgency? And Jesus says, for then there will be a great tribulation. He doesn't say a tribulation. He says a great tribulation. And I believe it's a period of the great tribulation, a period of tremendous devastation that's unparalleled in history, never to be repeated. And here I I see, I think, Jesus moving from the imprecise signs of the church age, which we looked at in verses 4 through 14. Generalized descriptions, imprecise about when it's going to happen. And now he's like, whoa, he's drilling down to specific events that more immediately precede the Lord's return. And from which I believe, again, I believe, and others do too, not just me, that the church will be absent from this great tribulation, from this tribulation period. Now, other good, godly people don't believe that. They believe that we're going through all this. Okay, so uh, I'm looking at other passages, but uh, I don't think so. So if I'm wrong, then everything that he's describing here we're going to live through and if I'm right some people alive some Jewish believers and those who come to faith in Christ during this time are going to go through this doesn't matter we're, we're prepared okay we're, we're ready either way but Daniel prophesied of these days in Daniel chapter 12 verse 1 it's part of why I believe that it's still to happen Now at that time, Michael, the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people, will arise and there will be a time of distress, notice the wording, such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people, everyone who was found written in the book, will be rescued. Okay, so a horrible time such as never has occurred. Now I find it hard to believe that what happened in AD 66 to AD 70 is the worst it ever got. Now, I wasn't alive then. I'm sure it was horrible. But it seems like a big stretch to say it's the worst it ever got. It's never going to happen. I believe that this is a time that Daniel prophesied. It's the time that Joel describes in Joel chapter 2 as a day of darkness and gloom. I believe it's the time that John is describing in Revelation chapter 6 through 16. And the language I believe, again, I believe, is too sensational. It's too sensational to apply only to the temple's destruction in AD 70, but that it looks ahead to the final three and a half years of Daniel's 70th week. And the Antichrist's slaughter and his persecution of the people will be so terrible that had that time not been cut short, and will, uh, that it's not cut short, no life would have lived. Okay, But Luke chapter 21, verses 23 and 24 Uh, He says, woe to those women who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babes in those days for there will be a great distress upon the land and wrath to his people and they will be fall by the edge of the sword and will be led captive into all the nations and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Okay, until that time is fulfilled which won't be until Christ comes back. So I think that This is why I'm saying this. So the elect would be the Jewish believers at the time and those who come to faith in Christ during that end time, that genuine time. And there won't be an annihilation because God is still drawing people to himself. That is his heart. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all nations. He's the God of all nations. He's rescuing all nations and all people. Look at 2414. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world for a witness to all the nations. Then the end shall come. Then the end shall come. Great tribulation. There's a second event. Not only a great tribulation, but a grand deception. A grand deception. The grand deception is verses 23 through 27. And there are two considerations. First, the response to this deception. And Jesus structurally, through the text, emphasizes that there is this... uh, the the response to the deception. Look at verse 23. He says, Then if anyone says to you, Behold, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe him. Now go down to verse 26. If therefore they say to you, Behold, he is in the wilderness, do not go forth. Or behold, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe them. The reality, that's that's the response. They're going to say this, don't believe them. The reality of it is given to us in in, uh, verses 24 and 25. For if, for false pride, Christ and false prophets will arise. False Christ and false prophets will arise. All right? 
So it's not that there might happen, but it will happen. All right? The response to any who claim, you know, so he repeats the deception. If they say, if they say, verses 23 and 26, he repeats that deception. It's coming. So the response is what? Don't believe him. If anybody says he's the Christ, if anyone says there is the Christ, you don't believe them. Now, in my understanding, the, the church of Christ is not going to be around, but there will be believers at the time, and they'll be seeking to be deceived by the horrors and the tremendous difficulties of the age will increase their vulnerability, will increase their susceptibility, increase their gullibility towards the presence and the proclamation that there's some Jesus out there that's going to, that's going to rescue them. No. The reason for rejecting the deception is given in three, three statements, three reasons. First, the reality of the deception. You know it's coming. So if you know it's coming, then you're less likely to be deceived by the fact that it is coming. So he says in verses 24 and 25, for if false Christ and false uh, will arise, they will arise. False Christ and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders. Okay, They're, they're coming. They're going to mislead many. And this is not new. We saw this back in chapter 7, right? Many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not do miracles in your name? And you'll say, I never knew you. So it's possible. This has happened in the past, and uh, it's, it's going to continue on into the future. The, we live in an age. We live now. We live in an age of religious imposters. And charlatans, people who, who will not declare that Christ is the only way to God. That personal faith or trust in Jesus is the only way. They were not going to declare that those who don't know Jesus are condemned to hell. They will not declare that living the Christian life is a sacrifice. That it's not all easy peasy, good and pleasing. That they will not declare that there's coming judgment. Why? Yeah, you can make more money that way. A little more profitable that way. You're a little more popular that way. And gain a bigger following that way. Then there are other, 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 others who will just present a palatable, powerful, and personally pleasing Jesus. Or religious system that kind of may include Jesus. I heard this this past week. Uh, Jennifer Anderson's new, uh, new medium uh, by the name of Carissa Schumacher, she claims to channel Jesus. Yeshua of the Old Testament. There you go. You can just go to your uh, local medium and you can hear what Jesus has to say. Uh, that's the, the way of the world. That's the world in which you live. And I believe that's four, chapter 4, verses four through 14. It's, it's a precursor. Because back there, we talked about uh, false Christs and deceivers and that. But this is amping it up. I think this is a little bit on steroids. If you look at the fact that they're going to use uh, the deception will be intensified. Because they're going to show great signs and wonders. Okay, when Jesus was here, remember what he would say often to people after he would cast out demons or he would heal them? And he would say, you know, just don't tell anybody. Just kind of keep it under wraps. Notice the contrast. He did it not to draw attention to himself. These signs were done to prove that he was the Christ, that believing you might have life in his name. John 20, verse 30. But these false Christs will do it so that people will believe in them and they'll draw attention to themselves. These religious imposters will come along and they'll try to draw. And they'll be so convincing that they will try to even deceive the elect, which... If they're really elect, they won't be able to deceive them, okay? Uh, that, that, that won't happen. God's people then, God's people now, and God's people in the future have one response to these people. Ignore them. Ignore them. Don't go after them. Don't chase after them. Don't embrace them. There's only one Jesus. And he came and he died on the cross. And he was buried and he rose again the third day. And he paid the debt for our sins, for your sins. If you will put your faith and your trust in what he did on the cross, you'll be delivered from the punishment of your sin and given the promise of new life in him. There's lots of imposters, but there's only one Jesus. 
Acts says, neither is there salvation in any other, for there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved, Acts 4.12. Are you saved? Are you trusting in this Jesus? In his death on the cross, and that alone is the payment for your sin? That's the only way. And when he comes again, this is the, the, the third in the, in the final demonstration, is that, or secondly, and, and, and he, Jesus tells us in advance, verse 25, so, first of all, um, we've been warned that, you know, false Christs are going to come, so don't get amped up. Jesus came. Uh, then he says in verse 25, uh, I'm telling you this in advance. A little advance warning. It's like me saying, you know, <clears throat> I've been to a timeshare presentation. Uh, don't go there. Uh, just telling you in advance. Waste of your time. Uh, it'll only be trouble for you most of the time. Okay, that's just, I'm just telling you. So that's a, that's a warning in advance. This is what Jesus is saying. I'm telling you in advance. False Christs are coming. You've been warned in advance. So listen to me. And finally, how is Jesus coming anyway? Oh, yeah. Jesus is over here. We got him in this back room. Oh, now he's, he's down at the, the Marriott downtown. We can come down and see him. Uh, you know, <clears throat> nobody knows he's there but a few of us. Uh, by the way, uh, he's in the back room. Read the text in verse 25, 27. For just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. When Jesus comes back, um, it's not going to be subtle. It will be sudden, but it's not going to be subtle. It's not going to be veiled. It will be visible. Okay? Okay? When Jesus comes back, it's not going to be confusing. We're going to know that he, that, he came, that he came back, right? I remember, it was 2011, Marlon and I had been, uh, we'd served overseas and we'd come back. We landed in Des Moines, we drove home. It was late at night, and we're driving, and the, the lightning was just flashing through the skies all over the place. It was not that, but it was similar to that, okay? From the east to the west and all this stuff, and we get home and we find out that we had driven through Either just before or just after, uh, a series of tornadoes had gone through northwest Iowa. Talk about God's providence and God's protection. But Jesus said, when I come back, it's not going to be a secret. It's going to be, boom, everybody's going everybody's to know, know it. And I believe it will be spectacular, it will be instantaneous and visible to everyone. His, his appearance will bring deliverance fully and finally. To his people, but it will bring judgment to those who aren't his children, his children when Jesus comes back. That abomination, uh, the tribulation, and the deception are signs of the certainty of Christ's return and the so sobriety of Christ's second coming, and all that is guaranteed. Look at verse 28. You, know, you read that, and at the end, you, you kind of go, What? Where the corpse is, there the vultures are? Well, that's true. And where these signs are, there Jesus will be. When these signs are finally fulfilled, boom, Jesus will show up, just like the vultures show up for, for, a, for a dead carcass. And I think that as I look at this text, uh, the, the, it's a guarantee that he's coming. The question is, are we ready for his coming? Now, I believe, as I said before, I believe that this is a, uh, speaks of that which is yet to come. The devastation, the tribulation is that which is yet to come. And don't believe that we as the church of, of Christ will actually be here. But I might be wrong. And if I'm wrong, then we will be here. But even if we're here, then we know what's coming. And this text, I believe, should be used in our hearts, first of all, to take those of you who do not know Jesus to entice you to consider putting your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that you might escape the judgment that's coming when Jesus does come back, and he is coming back. I believe that it should serve as an encouragement to those of us who know Jesus to share the gospel with people that they might not suffer the judgment that is to come. That it certainly is a, a warning about if, if we aren't here, it's a warning to those who are, and if we're going to be here, then it's a warning to us too of what we can do to endure. Our rest is not in a structure. 
Our rest is in a spiritual Savior, a spiritual temple. And we are actually, as the Word of God says, the temple of God if we're one of His children. And as we, as we take a few moments to, to take the bread and, and the juice, I hope it's a reminder of what Christ did for us so that we can be delivered from the judgment of God and experience the grace of God throughout our lives. It provides all believers with eternal life. The, what Jesus did on the cross not only provides us with the salvation, but it provides us with power to live. In the church age, verses 4 through 14, and if I'm wrong, uh, through the, the worst of the tribulation uh, in 15 through 28, before Jesus returns, but he gives us the grace and the strength. We are going to suffer persecution. That's, that's, that's it. And it also gives us hope uh, that we're delivered from God's judgment. It's a reason as we break the bread and we take the cup to celebrate, to rejoice and rest. Why me? Why me? Not because of me, but because of him. And it's a reason for those who don't know Jesus to repent, that you might escape the judgment that's coming upon those who re rebel against him. Let's pray. Father, I just pray that you take these truths that are sometimes hard to tease out, sometimes hard to, to fully grasp, and help us to make an application to our own lives. We, we trust you, Lord, that you're coming back. We trust you and believe, I believe that Certain of these things have yet to be fulfilled. Some of them have been fulfilled partially, but not fully and finally. And I pray that you'd give us boldness and courage to share the gospel with others so that they might be free from the condemnation that sin brings in their lives. They might enjoy a relationship with you. And even as our dear blessed Myrna said, you know, that they, they, would, they would hold on because the Lord is always with us. And they would understand the, the blessedness of this this great deal that comes with the salvation and all that comes with it, the, the new life that we have in Christ and the purpose and meaning we have in you. Lord, as we reflect upon your, 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 your sacrifice for us, let us do so with rest and rejoicing. And if any don't know you, that they would repent and believe. We pray in Jesus' name. week. Thanks for coming today. God bless.